Hello and welcome to this second look exploring session looking at the tragedy of Cleopatra as written by Samuel Daniel. Uh, this is a second look session so we're going to be rattling through this uh, play at pace um, giving it a, a little bit more oomph. Uh, we have hopefully tidied up the text a little bit more since last time but there still may be some, some errors uh, that we will be wheedling out as we go and just getting a, a, a sense of this previously when we ran this uh, we really got a sense of some of the storytelling that we really liked um, and there's some interesting staging options that this play may give us um, but we're going to embrace its uh, its full neoclassical um, quality for now um, and and just let the text uh, do the speaking um, it is uh, the tragedy of Cleopatra and reading Cleopatra today is Lindsay Beecham actor in Kirkcaldy Scotland Reading the choruses and uh, Sir Lucas is. Desna in Lancaster. Hi. Uh, reading Proculeus, uh, Arius, and uh, Titius is. Hi, I'm Eric. I wrote this down on a piece of paper, but I think I need to turn it over because I don't know where it is. Um, mm. Yeah. Uh, I went for Titius rather than Titius because I just thought that might be too comic. Um, but uh, again, pronunciations may vary. Uh, reading Philostratus and Dolabella is... Olga, hello everyone, an actor based in Moscow. And I'm your host, Robert Crichton. For once, I'm not reading stage directions because A, there aren't really any in this play. And, uh, and B, uh, second looks, we don't. We're just going to uh, make the action move forward. So I will be reading Caesar and I will also be reading The Messenger and Rodon. Um, so, without further ado, we're going to dive into the text. Uh, there is some introductory material, but we're going to skip by that. Um, if you want, there is a dedication to the Countess of Pembroke, uh, and there is an argument, um, uh, but uh, you can always read those in your own time. Hopefully there will be some links in the show description. So, without further ado, we will hand over to Cleopatra. Take it away. Yet do I live, and yet doth breath possess this hateful prison of a loathsome soul. Can no calamity nor no distress break heart and all and end a life so foul? Can Cleopatra live and with these eyes behold the dearest of her life bereft her? Ah, oh, can she entertain the least surmise of any hope that hath but horror left her? Why should I linger longer griefs to try? These eyes that saw what honour earth could give me now do behold the worst of misery, the greatest rack whereto fortune could drive me. He on whose shoulders all my rest relied, on whom the burden of my ambition lay, the atlas and the champion of my pride, that did the world of my whole fortune sway, lies fallen, confounded, dead in shame and dollars, following the unlucky party of my love. The ensign of mine eyes, the unhappy colours that him to mischief, me to ruin drove. And now the model made of misery, scorn to the world, born but for fortune's foil. My lusts have framed a tomb for me to lie, e'en in the ashes of my country's spoil. Ah, oh, who would think that I were she, who late, clad with the glory of the world's chief riches, admired of all the earth and wondered at, glittering in pomp, that heart and eye bewitches, should thus distressed and cast down from off that height, levelled with low, disgraced calamity, under the weight of such affliction sigh reduced unto the extremest misery. Am I the woman whose inventive pride adorned like Isis scorned mortality? 
Is't I that left my sense so without guide that flattery would not let him know twas I? Ah, oh, now I see they scarce tell truth that praise us. Crowns are beguiled, prosperity betrays us. What is become of all that stately train, those troops that won't attend prosperity? See what is left, what number doth remain, a tomb, two maids, and miserable I, and I, to adorn their triumphs, am reserved a captive, kept to beautify their spoils, whom Caesar labours so to have preserved, and seeks to entertain my life with wiles. No, Caesar, no, it is not thou canst do it, Promise, flatter, threaten extremity, employ thy wits and all thy force unto it. I have both hands and will, and I can die. Though thou of country, kingdom, and my crown, though thou of all my glory dost bereave me, though thou hast all my Egypt as thine own, yet Hast thou left me that which will deceive thee, that courage with my blood and birth innated, admired of all the earth as thou art now, cannot by threats be vulgarly abated to be thy slave that ruled as good as thou? Consider, Caesar, that I am a queen, and scorn the baseness of a servile thought. The world and thou dost know what I have been, and never think I can be so low brought that Rome should see my sceptre-bearing hands behind me bound and glory in my tears, that I should pass whereas Octavius Avia stands to view my misery that purchased hers. No, I disdain that head that wore a crown should stoop to take up that which others give. I must not be unless I be mine own. Tis sweet to die when we are forced to live. Nor had I troubled now the world thus long and been indebted for this little breath, but that I fear Caesar would offer wrong to my distressed seed after my death. Tis that which doth my dearest blood control. Tis that, alas, detains me from my tomb, whilst nature brings to contradict my soul the argument of mine unhappy womb. Oh, luckless issue of a woeful mother, the ungodly pledges of a wanton bed. You kings designed must now be slaves to other, or else not be, I fear, when I am dead. It is for you I temporize with Caesar and live this while for to procure your safety. For you I feign content and soothe his pleasure. Calamity herein hath made me crafty. But tis not long. I'll see what may be done. And come what will, this stands. I must die free. I'll be myself my thoughts do rest thereon. Blood, children, nature, all must pardon me. My soul yields honour up the victory, and I must be a queen, forget a mother. Yet mother would I be, were I not I, and queen would I not now be, were I other. But what know I 
if the heavens have decreed and that the sins of Egypt have deserved, the Ptolemies should fail and none succeed and that my weakness was there too reserved. That I should bring confusion to my state and fill the measure of iniquity. Licentiousness in me should end her date begun in ill-dispensed liberty. If so it be, and that my heedless ways have this so great a desolation raised, yet let a glorious end conclude my days. Though life were bad, my death may yet be praised, that I may write in letters of my blood a fit memorial for the times to come, to be example to such princes good that please themselves and care not what become. And Antony, because the world doth know that my misfortune hath procured thine, and my improvidence brought thee follow to lose thy glory and to ruin mine, by grappling in the ocean of our pride to sink each other's greatness both together, both equal shipwreck of our states to abide and like destruction to procure to either. If I should now our common fault survive, then all the world must hate me if I do it, Sith both our errors did occasion give, and both our faults have brought us both unto it. I being first enamoured with thy greatness, thou with my vanity bewitched wholly, and both betrayed with the outward pleasant sweetness that one ambition spoiled the other folly for which thou hast already duly paid the statute of thy error's dearest forfeit, whereby thy gotten credit was decayed, procured thee by thy wanton deadly surfeit. And next is my turn now to sacrifice to death and thee the life that doth reprove me. Our like distress, I feel, doth sympathize an e'en affliction makes me truly love thee, which, Antony, I must confess my fault. I never did sincerely until now. Now I protest I do. Now am I taught in death to love, in life that knew not how. For whilst my glory in that greatness stood, and that I saw my state and knew my beauty, saw how the world admired me, how they wooed, I then thought all men must love me of duty, and I love none. For my lascivious court, fertile in ever fresh and new choice pleasure, afforded me so bountiful disport, that I do think on love had never leisure. My vagabond desires no limits found, for lust is endless, pleasure hath no bound. Thou, coming from the strictness of thy city, the wanton pomp of courts yet never learnst, inured to wars in woman's wiles unwitty, whilst others feigned, thou fellst, to love in earnest, not knowing women like them best that hover and make least reckoning of a doting lover. And yet thou earnest but in my beauty's wane when new appearing wrinkles of declining wrought with the hand of years seemed to detain my grace's light as now but dimly shining. E'en in the confines of mine age, when I, failing of what I was, and was but thus, when such as we do deem in jealousy that men love for themselves and not for us. Then, and but thus, thou didst love most sincerely, 
Oh, Antony, that best deserves it better. This autumn of my beauty bought so dearly, for which in more than death I stand thy debtor, which I will pay thee with most faithful zeal, and that ere long no Caesar shall detain me. My death, my love, and courage shall reveal the which is all the world hath left to unstain me. And to the end I may deceive best Caesar, who doth so eagerly my life importune. I must prevail me of this little leisure, seeming to suit my mind unto my fortune, whereby I may the better me provide of what my death and honour best shall fit. A seeming base content must weary hide my last design till I accomplish it. And that hereby yet the world shall see that I, although unwise to live, had wit to die. Behold what furies still torment their tortured breast who by their doing ill have brought the world's unrest, which when being most distressed, yet more to vex their spirit, the hideous face of, face of sin in forms they most detest, stands ever in their sight. Their conscience still within, the eternal larum is, that ever barking dog that calls upon their midst. No means at all to hide, man from himself can find, no way to start aside out from the hell of mind but in himself confined, he still sees sin before, and winged-footed pain that swiftly comes behind, the which is evermore, the sure and certain gain in piety doth get, and wanton loose respect that doth itself forget. And Cleopatra now well sees the dangerous way she took and cared not bow, which led her to decay, and likewise makes us pay for her disordered lust, the interest of our blood, or like a liver serve our prey, under a band unjust as others shall think good. This hath her riot won, and thus she hath her state herself and us undone. Now every mouth can tell what close was muttered, how that she did not well to take the course she did, for now is nothing hid of what fear did restrain, no secret closely done, but now is uttered. The text is made most plain that flattery glossed upon, the bed of sin revealed, and all the luxury that shame would have concealed. The scene is broken down and all uncovered lies. The purple actors known, scarce men whom men despise. The complots of the wise prove imperfection smoke, and all what wonder gave to pleasure-gazing eyes lies scattered, dashed, all broke. Thus much beguiled have poor unconsiderate whites, these momentary pleasures, fugitive delights. Kingdoms I see we win, we conquer climates, yet cannot vanquish hearts nor force obedience. Affections kept in close concealed limits stand far without the reach of sword or violence. Who forced do pay us duty, pay not love. Free is the heart, the temple of the mind, the sanctuary sacred from above, where nature keeps the keys that loose and bind. No mortal hand, force, open can that door, so close shut up and locked to all mankind. I see men's bodies, only ours, no more, the rest another's right that rules the mind. Behold. My forces vanquished have this land, subdued that strong competitor of mine. All Egypt yields to my all-conquering hand, and all their treasure and themselves resign. Only this queen that have lost all this, all, to whom is nothing left except a mind, cannot a thought of yielding fall to be disposed as chance hath her designed. But, uh, Proculi, what hope doth she now give? Will she be brought to condescend to live? 
My lord, what time being sent from you to try to win her forth alive, if that I might, from out the monument where woefully she lives enclosed in most afflicted plight. No way I found, no means how to surprise her, but through a great adventure of the place, standing to treat, I labored to advise her to come to Caesar and to sue for grace. She said she craved not life, but leave to die, yet for her children prayed they might inherit, that Caesar would vouchsafe in clemency to pity them, although she deserved no merit. So leaving her for them, and since of late, with Gallus sent to try another time, the whilst he entertains her at the gate, I found the means up to the tomb to climb, wherein descending in the closet wa closest wise, and silent manner as I could contrive, her woman me descried, and out she cries, poor, poor Cleopatra, thou art taken alive, with that the queen brought from her side her knife, and even in the act to slab her martyred breast, I stepped with speed and held and saved her life, and forth her trembling hand the blade did rest. Ah, Cleopatra, why shouldst thou, said I, both injury thyself and Caesar so, bear, bar him the honour of his victory, whoever deals most mildly with his foe. Live and rely on him whose mercy will to thy submission always ready be. With that, as all amazed, she held her still. Twixt majesty confused and misery, her proud grieved eyes held sorrow and disdain. State and distress warring within her soul. Dying ambition dispossessed her reign, so base of affliction seemed to control. As like a burning lamp, whose liquor spent with intermittent flames when dead you deem it, sends forth a dying flash as discontent, that so the matter fails that should redeem it. So she, in spite to see her low brought state, when all her hopes were now consumed to naught, scorns yet to make an abject league with fate, or once descend into a servile thought. The imperious tongue, unused to beseech, authority confounds with prayers, so words of command conjoined with humble speech. Should she would live, yet scorned to pray her foe. What hath Caesar here to do, said she, in confines of the dead, in darkness living, will he not grant our sepulchres, sepulchres be free, but violate the privilege of dying? What? Must he f stretch forth his ambitious hand into the right of death and force us here? Hath misery no covert where to stand, free from the storm of pride? Is it safe nowhere? <laughs> Cannot my land, my gold, my crown suffice, and all oh, what I held dear to him made common, but that he must in this sort tyrannize the afflicted body of an woeful woman? Tell him my frailty and the gods have given sufficient glory if he could content him, and let him now with his desires make even, and leave me to this horror to lamenting. Now he hath taken all away from me. What must he take from myself by force? Ah, let him yet in mercy leave me free. The kingdom of this poor distressed course, no other crown I seek, no other good. Yet wish that Caesar would vouchsafe this grace to favor the poor, poor offspring of my blood. Confused issue, yet a Roman race, if blood and name be links of love in princes, not spurs of hate, my poor Cesario may find favor, notwithstanding mine offenses, and Caesar's blood may Caesar's raging stay, but if that with the torrent of my fall, all must be wrapped with furious violence, and no respect, nor no regard at all, can aught with nature or with blood dispense. And be it so, if needs it must be so. There stays and shrinks in horror of her state, when I began to mitigate her woe, and thy great mercies unto her relate, wishing her not despair, but rather come and sue for grace, and shake off all vain fears. No doubt she should obtain his gentle doom, as she desired, both for herself and hers. And... So, with much ado, well 
pacified seeming to be, she showed content to live, saying she was resolved by doom to abide and to accept what favor thou wouldst give. And herewithal craved also that she might perform her last rites to her lost beloved, to sacrifice to him that wrought her plight, and that she might not be by force removed. I, granting from thy part this request, left her for then, seeming in better rest. But dost thou think she will remain so still? I think, and do assure myself she will. Ah, private men found not the hearts of princes, whose actions oft bear contrary pretenses. Why, tis her safety for to yield to thee. But tis more honour for her to die free. She may thereby procure her children's good. Princes respect their honour more than blood. Can princes' power dispense with nature, then? To be a prince is more than be a man. There is none but have in time persuaded been. And so might she too, were she not a queen. Diverse respects will force her be reclaimed. Princes like lions never will be tamed. A private man may yield and care not how, but greater parts will break before they bow. And sure I think she'll never condescend to live to grace our spoils with her disgrace. But yet, let still a wary watch attend to guard her person and to watch the place and look that none with her come to confer. Shortly, myself, will go to visit her. Opinion. How dost thou molest the affected mind of restless man, who following thee never can nor ever shall attain to rest? Forgetting what thou sayst is best, yet, lo, that best he finds far wide of what thou promisedst before. For in the same he looked for more, which proves but small when once is tried, then something else thou find'st beside, to draw him still from thought to thought, when in the end all proves but naught. Farther from rest he finds him than then at first when he began. Oh, oh, malcontent seducing guest, contriver of our greatest woes, which born of wind and fed with shows, dost nurse thyself in thine unrest, judging ungotten things the best, or what thou in conceit designst, and all things in the world dost deem, not as they are, but as they seem, which shows their state thou ill definest, and lives to come in present pinst. For what thou hast, thou still dost lack. O mindle tormentor, body's rack, vain promiser of that sweet rest which never any yet possessed. If we unto our ambition tend, then dost thou draw our weakness on with vain imagination. Of that which never hath an end, or if that lust we apprehend, how doth that pleasant plague infest? Oh, what strange forms of luxury thou straight dost cast enticers by, and tell'st us that is ever best, which we have never yet possessed. And that more pleasure rests beside in something that we have not tried. And when the same likewise is had, and all is one and all is bad. This, Antony can say, is true, and Cleopatra knows tis so. By the experience of their woe, she can say she never knew, but that just found pleasures new, and was never satisfied. He can say by proof of toil, ambition is a vulture vile, that feeds upon the heart of pride, and finds no rest when all is tried. For worlds cannot confine the one, the other, lists and bounds hath none. And both subvert the mind, the state, procure destruction, envy, hate. And now when all this is proved vain, yet opinion leaves not here, but sticks to a patch of near. Persuading now how she shall gain honour by death and fame attain. And what a shame it were to live, her kingdom lost, her lover dead. And so with this persuasion led. Despair doth such a courage give that naught else can her mind relieve, nor yet divert her from that thought. To this conclusion all is brought. This is that rest this vain world lends, to end in death, that all thing ends. How deeply, Arius, am I bound to thee, that saves from death this wretched life of mine, obtaining Caesar's gentle grace for me when I, of all helps else, despaired but thine. 
although I see in such a woeful state, life is not that which should be much desired, since all our glories come to end their date, our country's honour and our own expired. Now that the hand of wrath hath ogone us, living as twere in the arms of our dead mother, with blood under our feet ruin upon us, and in a land most wretched of all other, when yet we reckon life our dearest good. And so we live, we care not how we live, so deep we seal impressed in our blood, that touch which nature with our breath did give, and yet what bloodstock words hath learning found to blow against the fear of death and dying? What comforts unseek eloquence can sound, and yet all fails us in the point of trying? For whilst we reason with the breath of safety, without the compass of destruction living, what precepts show we then, what courage lofty in taxing others, other, other spheres in counsel giving? When all this air of sweet contrived words proves but weak armour to defend the heart. For when this life, pale fear and terror, boards, where are our precepts then? Where is our art? Oh, who is he that from himself can turn, that bears about the body of man? who doth not toil and labour to adjourn the day of death by any means he can. All this I speak to then myself to excuse for my base begging of a servile breath, wherein I grant myself much to be used so shamefully to seek to avoid my death. Philostratus, that same self care to live Possesseth all alike, and grieve not then. Nature doth us no more than others give, though we speak more than men, we are but men. And yet, in truth, these miseries to see wherein we stand in most extreme distress might to ourselves sufficient motives be to loathe this life and weigh our death the less. For never any age hath better taught what feeble footing pride and greatness hath how improvident prosperity is caught and clean confounded in the day of wrath. See how dismayed confusion keeps those streets that naught but mirth and music late resounded. How nothing with our eye but horror meets our state, our wealth, our pride and all confounded. Yet what weak sight did not discern from far this black arising tempest, all confounding, who did not see we should be what we are when pride and riot grew to such abounding, when dissolute impiety possessed the unrespective minds of such a people, when insolent security found rest in wanton thoughts, with lust and ease made feeble, then with unwary peace, with fat-fed pleasure, new fresh invented riots still detected, Purchased with all the Ptolemy's rich treasure, our laws, our gods, our mysteries neglected. Who saw not how this confluence of vice, this inundation of disorders, must at length of force pay back the bloody price of sad destruction? A reward for lust. Oh, thou and I have heard and read and known of proud states, and framed as woefully encumbered and framed by them, examples for our own, which now among examples must be numbered. For this decree a law from high is given, an ancient canon uh, of eternal date, in consistory of the stars of heaven, entered the book of unavoided fate, that no state can in height of happiness in the exaltation of their glory stand, but thither once arrived, declining less, ruin themselves or fall by others' hand. Thus doth the ever-changing course of things run a perpetual circle, ever turning. And that same day that highest glory brings, brings us unto the point of back returning. For sense of sensuality doth ever accompany felicity and greatness, a faithful witch whose charms do leave us never till we leave all in sorrow for our sweetness. When yet ourselves must be the cause we fall, although the same be decreed on high, our ever still must bear the blame of all. This must it be. Earth ask not heaven why, 
Yet mighty men with weary, jealous hand strive to cut off all obstacles of fear. All whatsoever seems but to withstand their least conceited quiet held so dear, and so entrench themselves with blood, with crimes, with all injustices their fears dispose. Yet for all this we see how oftentimes the means they work to keep are means to lose. And sure, I cannot see how this can stand with great Augustus' safety and his honor to cut off all succession from our land for her offense that pulled the wars upon her. Why must Horishi pay the price of that? The price is life that they are rated at. Caesario too, issued of Caesar's blood? Plurality of Caesars are not good. Alas, what hurt procures his feeble arm? Not for it doth, but that it may do harm. Then when it offers her to repress the same. This best to quench a spark before a flame. Tis inhumane and innocent to kill. Such innocence seldom remains so still. And sure his death may procure our peace. Competitors the subject dearly buys. And so that our affliction may surcease, let great men be the people's sacrifice. But see... Where Caesar comes himself to try and work the mind of our distressed queen, to apprehend some false hope, whereby she might be drawn to have her fortune seen. But yet I think Rome will not see that face, that quell her champions blush in base disgrace. What, Cleopatra, dost thou doubt so much of Caesar's mercy that thou hidest thy face? Or dost thou think thy offences can be such that they surmount the measure of our grace? O oh, Caesar, not for that I fly thy sight. My soul this sad retire of sorrow chose, but that my oppressed thoughts a boring light, like best in darkness my disgrace to enclose. And here to these close limits of despair, this solitary horror where I bide. Caesar, I thought no Roman should repair, more after him who here oppressed died. Yet now here at thy conquering feet I lie, poor captive soul that never thought to bow, whose happy foot of rule and majesty stood late on that same ground thou standest now. Rise, queen, none but thyself is cause of all, and yet would all were but thine own alone, that others' ruin had not with thy fall brought Rome her sorrows to my triumph's moan. For breaking off the league of love and blood thou makest my winning joy again unpleasing, as if the eye of grief must look into our good, Thorough the horror of our own blood shedding, and all we must attribute unto thee. To me, Caesar, what should a woman do, oppressed with greatness? What was it for me to contradict my lord, being bent thereto? I was by love, by fear, by weakness made an instrument to such designs as these. For when the Lord of all the Orient bade, who but obeyed, who was not glad to please? And how could I withdraw my succoring hand from him that had my heart or what was mine? The interest of my faith in straightest band my love to his most firmly did combine. Love? Alas, no, it was intinated hatred that thou and thine hast ever borne our people, that made thee seek all means to have us scattered, to disunite our strength and make us feeble, and therefore did that breast nurse our dissension, with hope to exalt thyself, augment thy state, and prey upon the rack of our contention, and with the rest our foes to joy thereat. Oh, Caesar, see how easy tis to accuse whom fortune hath made faulty by their fall. The wretched conqueror may not refuse the titles of reproach he's charged withal, 
the conquering cause hath right, wherein you art. The vanquished still is judged the worser part, which part is mine, because I lost my part, no lesser than the portion of a crown. Enough for me, alas, what needed art to gain by others, but to keep mine own. But here, let weaker powers note what tis to neighbour great competitors too near. If we take part, we oft do perish thus. If neutral bide, both parties we must fear. Alas, what shall the forced partakers do when following none? Yet must they perish too? But Caesar, sith thy right and cause is such, be not a heavy weight upon calamity. Depress not the afflicted overmuch. The chiefest glory is the victor's lenity. The inheritance of mercy from him take, of whom thou hast thy fortune and thy name. Great Caesar, me a queen at first did make, and let not Caesar now confound the same. Read here the lines which I still keep with me, the witness of his love and favours ever. And God forbid this should be said of thee, that Caesar wronged the favourite of Caesar. For look what I have been to Antony. Think thou the same I might have been to thee. And here I do present thee with the note of all the treasure, all the jewels rare that Egypt hath in many ages got. And look what Cleopatra hath is there. Nay, there's not all said down within that roll. I know some things she hath reserved apart. What vile, ungrateful wretch darest thou control, thy queen and sovereign, caitiff as thou art? Hold, hold, a poor revenge can work so feeble. Oh, Caesar, what a great indignity is this, that here my vassal subject stands to accuse me to my lord of treachery. If I reserved some certain women's toys, alas, it was not for myself, God knows, poor miserable soul, that little joys in trifling ornaments in outward shows, but what I kept, I kept to make my way unto thy Libya and Octavia's grace, that thereby in compassion moved they might mediate thy favour in my case. Well, Cleopatra, fear not. Thou shalt find what favour thou desirest or canst expect. For Caesar never yet was found but kind to such as yield and can themselves subject. And therefore give thou comfort to thy mind. Relieve thy soul, thus overcharged with care. How well I will entreat thee, thou shalt find, so soon as some affairs dispatched are. Uh, till then, farewell. Thanks, thrice renowned Caesar. Poor Cleopatra rests thine own for ever. No marvel, Caesar, though our greatest spirits have to the power of such a charming beauty have been brought to yield the honour of their merits, forgetting all respect of other duty. Then whilst the glory of her youth remained, the wandering object to each wanton eye, before her full of sweet, with sorrow waned, came to the period of this misery. If still, even in the midst of death and horror, such beauty shines through clouds of age and sorrow, if even those sweet decays seem to plead for her, which from affliction moving graces borrow, if in calamity she could thus move, 
What could she do adorned with youth and love? What could she do then when as spreading wide the pomp of beauty in her glory died? When armed with wonder, she could use beside the vengeance of her love, hope and delight. Beauty, daughter of marvel, oh, see how thou canst disgracing sorrow sweetly grace. What power thou show'st in a distressed brow. What makes affliction fair gives tears their grace. What can untressed locks, can torn rent hair, a weeping eye, a wailing face be fair? I see that then heartless feature can content, and that true beauty needs no ornament. What? In a passion, Dolabella, what? Take heed, let others' fresh examples be thy warning. What mischiefs these so idle humours breed, whilst error keeps us from a true discerning? Indeed, I saw she laboured to impart her <coughs> sweetest graces in her saddest cheer, presuming on the face that knew the art to move with what aspect so e'er it were, but all in vain. She takes her aim amiss, the ground and mark her level much deceives. Time now hath altered all, for neither is she as she was, nor we as she conceives. And therefore now, to a best, she left such badness, folly in youth is sin, in age tis madness. And for my part, I seek but to entertain in her some feeding hope to draw her forth. The greatest trophy that my travails gain is to bring home a prizel of such worth. And now, see if that she seems so well content to be disposed by us, without more stay, she with her children shall it to Rome be sent, whilst I by Syria thither take my way. O oh, fearful frowning nemesis, daughter of justice most severe, that art the world's great arbitress and queen of causes reigning here, whose swift, sure hand is the ever near, eternal justice, righting wrong, who never yet deferrest long, the proud's decay, the weak's redress. But through thy power everywhere dost raise the great and raise the less. The less made great dost ruin to, to show the earth what heaven can do. Thou from dark closed eternity, from thy black cloudy hidden seat, the world's disorders dost descry, which when they swell so proudly great, we burst in order nature set. Thou givest thy old confounding doom, which none can know before it come. The inevitable destiny, which neither wit nor strength can let, fast chained unto necessity, in mortal things doth order so the alternate course of weal or woe. O oh, lo, the powers of heaven do play with travailed mortality, and doth their weakness still betray in their best prosperity. When being listed up so high, they look beyond themselves so far, but to themselves they take no care, while swift confusion down doth lay their late proud mountain vanity, bringing their glory to decay. And with the ruin of their fall extinguish people, state and all, but is it justice that all we, the innocent or multitude, for great men's faults should punished be, and to destruction thus pursued? Oh, why should the heavens us include within the compass of their fall, who of themselves procured all? Or do the gods, in close decree, occasion take how to extrude man from the earth with cruelty? <laughs> ah, no, the gods are ever just. Our faults excuse their rigour must. This is the period fate set down to Egypt's fat prosperity, which now unto her greatest groan must perish thus, by course must die. And some must be the causes why this revolution must be wrought, as born to bring their state to naught, to change the people and the crown and purge the world's iniquity, which vice so far hath overgrown as we, so they that treat us thus must one day perish like to us. And thus ending the chorus at the end of Act 3, we uh, change to be characters again for Act 4. Never, friend, rode on in a better hour. Could I have met thee then, ain't I? How art now I do? 
having affliction in the greatest power upon my soul and none to tell it to. For tis some ease our sorrows to reveal if they to whom we shall impart our woes seem but to feel a part of what we feel and, and meet us with a sigh but at a close. And never, friend, Sir Lucas, foundst thou one that better could bear such a part with thee, who by his own knows others cares to moan and can in like accord of grief agree and, and therefore tell the oppression of thy heart. Tell to an ear prepared and tuned to care, and I will likewise unto thee impart as sad a tale as what thou shalt declare. So shall we both our mournful plaints combine. Ah, well, my state, and thou shalt pity mine. Well, then, thou knowest how I have lived in grace with Cleopatra, and esteemed in court, as one of counsel and of chiefest place, and ever held my credit in that sort. Till now, in this confusion of our state, when thinking to have used a mean to climb and fled the wretched, flown unto the great, following the fortune of the present time, and come to be cast down and ruined clean, and in the course of mine own plots undone. For having all the secrets of the Queen revealed to Caesar to have favour won, my treachery is quite a big disgrace, my falsehood loathed, and not without great reason, though good for him, yet princes in this case do hate the traitor, though they love the treason. For how could he imagine I would be faithful to him, being false unto mine own, and false to such a bounteous queen as she, that had me raised and made my honour known? My sword was not for zeal to him I bear, but for base fear, or mine own state to settle. Weakness is false, and faith in cowards rare. Fear finds out shifts, timidity is subtle. And therefore scorned of him, scorned of mine own, hateful to all that look into my state, despised Sir Lucas now is only grown the mark of infamy that's pointed at. Tis much thou sayest to know too much to feel, and I do grieve and do lament thy fall. But yet all this which thou dost here reveal compared with mine will make thine seem but small. Although my fault be in the self-same kind, yet in degree far greater, far more hateful, mine sprung of mischief, thine from feeble mind, I stained with blood, thou only but ungrateful. For unto me did Cleopatra give the best and dearest treasure of her blood, lovely Cesario, whom she would, she would, should live, free from the dangers wherein Egypt stood. And unto me with him this charge she gave, here, Rodon, take, convey from out this coast, this precious gem, this chiefest that I have, the jewel of my soul I value most. Guide him to Eden, dear, and lead him far from hence, safeguard him where, secure he may remain, till better fortune call him back from thence, and Egypt's peace be reconciled again. For this is he that may our hopes bring back the rising sun of our declining state. These be the hands that may restore our rack, and raise the broken ruins made of late. He may give limits to the boundless prize, a, Pride of fierce Octavius, and abate his might. Great Julius offspring, he may come to guide the empire of the world as his by right. Oh, how he seems the model of his sire. Oh, how I gaze my Caesar in his face. Such was his gait, so did his looks aspire. Such was his threatening brow, such was his grace. High-shouldered, and his forehead even as high. And, oh, if he had not been born so late, he might have ruled the world's great monarchy and now have been the champion of our state. Then unto him, O oh dear my son, she says, son of my youth, fly hence, O oh fly be gone, reserve thyself ordained for better days, for much thou hast to ground thy hopes upon. Leave me thy woeful mother, to endure the fury of this tempest here alone. Who cares not for herself, so thou be sure thou mayst revenge when others can but moan. Rodon will see thee safe, Rodon will guide thee and thy ways, thou shalt not need to fear. Rodon, my faithful servant, will provide what shall be best for thee, take thou no care. And, O oh, good Rodon, look well to his youth, the ways are long, the dangers everywhere. 
I urge it not that I do doubt thy truth. Mothers will cast the worst and always fear. The absent danger greater still appears, less fears he who is near the thing he fears. And, oh, I know not what presaging thought my spirit suggests of luckless bad event, but yet it may be tis but love doth dote, or idle shadows which my fears present. But yet the memory of mine own fate makes me fear his, and yet why should I fear? His fortune may recover better state, and he may come in pomp to govern here, but yet I doubt the genius of our race by some malignant spirit comes o'erthrown. Our blood must be extinct in my disgrace. Egypt must have no more kings of their own. Then let him stay, and let us fall together, Sith. It is for decreed that we must fall. Yet who knows what may come? Let him go thither. What merchant in one vessel ventures all? Let us divide our stars. Go, go, my son. Let not the fate of Egypt find thee here. Try if so be thy destiny can shun the common rack of us by being there. But who is he? Found ever yet defence against the heavens, or hid him anywhere? Then what need I to send thee so far hence to seek thy death that may so well as well die here? And here die with thy mother, die in rest, not travelling to what will come to thee. Why should we leave our blood unto the east when Egypt may a tomb sufficient be? Oh, my divided soul, what shall I do whereon shall now my resolution rest? What, what were I best resolved to yield unto when both are bad? How shall I know the best? Stay. I may hap so work with Caesar now that he may yield him to restore thy right. Go, Caesar never will consent that thou so near in blood shalt be so great in might. Then take him, Rodan. Go, my son. Farewell, but stay. There's something else that I would say, yet nothing now, but, oh God, speed thee well, my saying more that more make, make thee stay. Yet let me speak, it may be tis the last that ever I shall speak to thee, my son. Do mothers use to part in such post-haste? What must I end when I have scarce begun? Oh no, dear heart, is no such lender twine wherewith the knot is tied twixt thee and me. That blood within thy veins came out of mine, parting from thee I part from part of me, and therefore must I must speak. Yet what? O oh, son! Hear more she would, when more she could not say. Sorrow rebounding back, whence it began, filled up the passage and quite stopped the way, when sweet Cesario, with a princely sprite, though comfortless himself, did comfort give with mildest words, persuading her to bear it. And as for him, she should not need to grieve, and I, with protestations of my part, swore by that faith which sworn I did deceive that I would use all care, all wit and art to see him safe, and so we took our leave. Scarce had we travailed to our journey's end, when Caesar, having knowledge of our way, his agents after us with speed did send to labour me, Cesario to betray, who with rewards and promises so large assailed me then, that I grew so content and back to Rhodes did reconvey my charge, pretending that Octavius for him sent, to make him king of Egypt presently. And thither come, seeing himself betrayed, and in the hands of death, through treachery, wailing his state, thus to himself he said, Lo, here brought back by subtle train to death, betrayed by tutor's faith of traitors rather, my fault, my blood, a minor fence, my birth, a being son of such a mighty father, 
from India, whither sent by mother's care to be reserved from Egypt's common rack to Rhodes, so long the arms of tyrants are, I am by Caesar's subtle reach brought back, here to be made to the oblivion to the oblation of his for his fears who doubts the poor revenge these hands may do him respecting neither blood nor youth nor years or how small safety can my death be to him and is this all the good of being born great wretched greatness proud rich misery pompous distress glittering calamity is it for this ambitious father's sweat to purchase blood for them and theirs is this the issue that their glories get to leave a sure destruction to their heirs oh how far better had it been for me from low descent derived of humble birth to have eat the sour sweet sour bread of poverty and drunk of Nilus stream and Nilus earth under the covering of some quiet cottage free from the wrath of heaven secure in mind untouched when sad events of prince's dotage confounds whatever mighty it doth find and not to have stood in their way whose condition is to have all made dear and all things plain between them and the mark of their ambition that nothing let the full sight of their reign where nothing then stands that stands not in submission where greatness must all in itself contain kings will be alone competitors must down near death he stands that stands too near a crown such is my case, for Caesar will have all. My blood must seal the assurance of his state. Yet our weak state that blood assure him shall, whose wrongful shedding gods and men do hate. Injustice never scapes unpunished still, though men revenge not, yet the heavens will. And thou, Augustus, that with bloody hand cutst off succession from another's race, mayst find the heavens thy vows so to withstand that others may deprive thine in like case. When thou mayst see thy proud contentious bed yielding thee of thine that may inherit, subvert thy blood, place others in their stead to pay this thy injustice her due merit, if it be true. As who can that deny, which sacred priests of Memphis do foresay? Some of the offspring yet of Antony shall all the rule of this whole empire sway. And then, Augustus, what is it thou gainst by poor Antillus' blood, or of this of mine? Nothing but this thy victory thou stainst, and pulls the wrath of heaven on thee and thine. In vain doth man contend against the stars, for what he seeks to make his wisdom mars. Yet in the meantime, we whom fates reserve the bloody sacrifices of ambition, we feel the smart, whatever they deserve, and we endure the present time's condition. The justice of the heavens, revenging thus, doth only sacrifice itself, not us. Yet tis a pleasing comfort that doth ease the affliction in so great extremity. To think their like destruction shall appease our ghosts, who did procure our misery. But dead we are, uncertain what shall be, and living we are sure to feel the wrong. Our certain ruin we ourselves do see, they joy the while, and we know not how long. But yet, Caesario, thou must die content, for men will moan, and God revenge the innocent. Thus he complained, and thus thou hearst my shame. But well, how hath Caesar now rewarded thee? As he hath thee. And I expect the same as fell to Theodore to fall on me, for he, one of my coat, having betrayed the young Antillus son of Antony, and at his death from of his neck conveyed a jewel, which being asked he did deny, Caesar occasion took to hang him straight. 
Such instruments with princes live not long. Although they need us, actors of deceit, and still our sight seems to upbraid their wrong, and therefore we must needs this danger run, and in the net of our own guile be caught. We must not live to bray what we have done, for what is done must not appear their fault. But here comes Cleopatra, woeful queen, and our shame will not that we should be seen. What hath my face yet power to win a lover? Can this torn remnant serve to grace me so that it can Caesar's secret plots discover what he intends with me, me and mine to do? Why then, poor beauty, thou hast done thy last and best good service thou couldst do unto me. For now the time of death revealed thou hast, which in my life didst serve but to undo me. Here, Dolabella, far forsooth in love, writes how that Caesar means forthwith to send both me and mine the heir of Rome to prove, there his triumphant chariot to attend. I thank the man both for his love and letter. The one comes fit to warn me thus before, but for the other I must die his debtor, for Cleopatra now can love no more. But having leave, I must go take my leave and last farewell of my dead Antony, whose dearly honoured tomb must here receive this sacrifice the last before I die. O oh, sacred, ever memorable stone that hast without my tears within my flame, receive the oblation of the wofulest moan that ever yet from sad affliction came. And you, dear relics of my Lord and love, the sweetest parcels of the faithfulest liver. Let no impious hand dare to remove you out from hence, but rest you here forever. Let Egypt now give peace unto you dead, that living gave you trouble and turmoil. Sleep quiet in this everlasting bed, in foreign land preferred before your soil. And oh, if that the sprites of men remain after their bodies and do never die, then hear thy ghost, thy captive spouse complain and be attentive to her misery. But if that laboursome mortality found this sweet error, only to confine the curious search of idle vanity that would the depth of darkness undermine, or rather to give rest unto the thought of wretched man with the aftercoming joy of those conceived fields whereon we dote to pacify the present world's annoy. If it be so, why speak I then to the air? But tis not so. My Antony doth hear, his ever-living ghost attends my prayer, and I do know his hovering sprite is near, and I will speak and pray and mourn to thee, O pure immortal love that deigns to hear. I feel thou answerst my credulity with touch of comfort, finding none elsewhere. For thou know'st these hands entombed thee here of late, free and unforced, which now must servile be, reserved for bands to grace proud Caesar's state, who seeks in me to triumph over thee. Oh, if in life we could not severed be, shall death divide our bodies now asunder? 
Must thine in Egypt, mine in Italy, be kept the monuments of fortune's wonder? If any powers be there, whereas thou art, sith our own country gods betray our case, O oh, work they may their gracious help impart to save thy woeful wife from such disgrace. Do not permit she should in triumph show the blush of her reproach joined with thy shame, but rather let that hateful tyrant know that thou and I had power to avoid the same. But what do I spend breath and idle wind in vain invoking a conceived aid? Why do I not myself occasion find to break the bounds wherein myself am stayed? Words are for them that can complain and live, whose melting hearts composed of baser frame can to their sorrows time and leisure give. But Cleopatra may not do the same. No, Antony, thy love requireth more. A lingering death with thee deserves no merit. I must myself force open wide a door to let out life and so unhouse my spirit. These hands must break the prison of my soul and come to thee, there to enjoy like state as doth the long-pent solitary fowl that hath escaped her cage and found her mate. This sacrifice, to sacrifice my life, is that true incense that doth best beseem these rites may serve a life-desiring wife, who doing them to have done enough doth deem. My heart blood should the purple flowers have been, which here upon thy tomb are thee are offered. No smoke but dying breath should here be seen, and this it had been too, had I been suffered. But what have I, save these bare hands to do it? And these weak fingers are not iron-pointed, they cannot pierce the flesh being put unto it. And I, of all means, else am disappointed. But yet I must find a way and means seek how to come unto thee whatsoe'er I do. O oh, death, art thou so hard to come by now that we must pray, entreat, and seek thee too? But I will find thee wheresoe'er thou lie, for who can stay a mind resolved to die? And now I go to work the effect indeed. I'll never send more words or sighs to thee. I'll bring my soul myself, and that with speed, myself will bring my soul to Antony. Come, go, my maids, my fortune's soul attenders that minister to misery and sorrow. Your mit mistress you unto your freedom renders and quits you from all charge yet ere tomorrow. And now by this, I think the man I sent is near returned that brings me my dispatch. God grant his cunning sought to good event and that his skill may well beguile my watch. So shall I shun disgrace, leave to be sorry, fly to my love, scape my foe, free my soul. So shall I act the last act of my glory, die like a queen and rest without control. Mysterious Egypt, wonder breeder, strict religion's strange observer, state order zeal, the best rule keeper, fostering still and temperate fervour. Oh, how camest thou to lose so holy all religion, law, and order, and thus become the most unholy of all lands that Nihilus border? How could confused disorder enter where stern law sat so severely? 
durst weep the lust and riot venter, the eye of justice looking nearly. Could not those means that made thee great be still the means to keep thy state? <laughs> I know, the course of things requireth change and alteration ever. That same continuance man desireth, the unconstant world yieldeth never. We in our councils must be blinded and not see what doth import us, and oftentimes the thing least minded is the thing that most must hurt us. Yet they that have the stern in guiding, tis their fault that should prevent it, but oft they see their country sliding, take their ease as though contented. We imitate the greater powers, the prince's manners, the prince's manners fashion, ours. The example of their light regarding vulgar looseness much in senses. Vice uncontrolled grows wide, enlarging. King's small faults be great offences. And this hath, hath set the window open unto license, lust, and riot. This way confusion first found broken, whereby entered our disquiet. Those laws that Zoroaster founded and the Ptolemies observed. Hereby first came to be confounded, which our states are long preserved. The wanton luxury of court, who formed the people of like sort, for all, respecting private pleasure, universally consenting to abuse their time, their treasure, in their own delights contenting, and future dangers not respecting, whereby, oh how easy matter, made this so general neglecting, infused weakness to disaster. Caesar found the effects true tried in his easy entrance maker, who at the sight of arms descried all of our people, all forsaken. For riot, worse than war, so sore, had wasted all our strength before. And thus is Egypt servile rendered to the insolent destroyer, and all their sumptuous treasure tendered, all her wealth, that did betray her, which poison, oh, if heavens be rightful, may so far infect her senses that Egypt's pleasures so delightful may breed them the like offences. And Romans learn our way of weakness, be instructed in our vices, that our spoils may spoil your greatness, overcome with our devices. Fill full your hands and carry home enough from us to ruin Rome. I'm muted at present. Uh, With Dolly Bella, we can't hear you. Yes, muted at present. Sorry. Sorry. Come tell me, Titius, every circumstance, how Cleopatra did receive my news. Tell every look, each gesture, countenance, that she did in my letters reading use. I shall, my lord, so far as I could note, or my conceit observe in any wise. It was the time when, as she having got leave to her dearest dead to sacrifice, and now was issuing out the monument, with odours, incense, garlands in her hand, when I approached as one from Caesar sent, and did her close thy message to understand. She turns her back, and with her takes me in, reads in thy lines thy strange unlooked-for tale, and reads and smiles, and stays, and doth begin again to read, then blushed, then was pale. And having ended with a sigh, refolds thy letter up, with a fixed eye, which steadfast her imagination holds, she mused a while, standing confusedly at length. Ah, friend, saith she, Tell thy good lord how dear I hold his pitying of my case, that out of his sweet nature can afford a miserable woman so much grace. Tell him how much my heavy soul doth grieve, merciless Caesar should so deal with me. Pray him that he would all the counsel give that might divert him from such cruelty. As for my love, say Antony hath all. Say that my heart is gone into the grave with him in whom it rests and ever shall. I have it not myself, nor have, nor cannot have. Yet tell him he shall more command of me than any whosoever living can. 
he that so sh friendly shows himself to be a right kind Roman and a gentleman, though although his nation fatal unto me, have had mine age spoil my youth a prey, yet his affection must accept to be that favors one distressed in such decay. Was he worthy then to have been loved? Cleopatra was her glory lasted before she had declining fortune proved or seen her honor racked, her flower blasted. Now there is nothing left but disgrace, nothing but her affliction that can move. Tell Dolabella, one that's in her case, poor soul needs rather pity now than love. But shortly shall thy lord hear more of me. And ending so her speech, no longer stayed, but hastened to the tomb of Antony, and this was all she did and all she said. Oh, sweet distressed lady, what hard heart could choose but pity thee and love thee too? Thy worthiness, the state wherein thou art, requireth both, and both I vow to do. Although ambition lets not seize a sea, the wrong he doth thy majesty and sweetness, which makes him now exact so much of thee, to add unto his pride, to grace his greatness. He knows thou canst not hurt procure us now, since all thy strength is seized unto our hands, nor fears he that, but rather labours how he might show Rome so great a queen in, in bands, that our great ladies, and in thee so much, that stained them all and held them in such wonder, might joy to see thee, and thy fortune such thereby extolling him that brought thee under. But I will seek to stay it what I may. I am but one, yet one that Caesar loves. And oh, if now I could do more than pray, then shouldst you know how far affection moves. But what my power in prayer may prevail, I'll join them both to hinder thy disgrace. And even this present day, I will not fail to do my best with Caesar in this case. And, sir, even now herself hath letters sent. I met her messenger as I came hither with a dispatch, as he to Caesar sent, went, but knows not what imports her sending hit thither. Yet this he told, how Cleopatra late was come from sacrifice, how richly clad was served to dinner in most sumptuous state with all the bravest ornaments she had. How, having dined, she writes and sends away him straight to Caesar, and commanded then all who depart the tomb, and none to stay but her two maids and one poor countryman. Why, then I know she sends to have audience now, and means to experience what her state can do, to see if majesty will make him bow to what affliction could not move him to. No, oh, if now she could but bring a view of that fresh beauty she in youth possessed, the argument wherewith she overthrew the wit of Julius Caesar and the rest, then happily Augustus might relent, whilst powerful love, far stronger than ambition, might work in him and mind to be content to grant her asking in the best condition. But being as she is, yet doth she merit to be respected, for what she hath been, the wonder of her kind, of rarest spirit, a glorious lady and a mighty queen. Now, but by a little weakness falling, to do that which perhaps she was forced to do, alas, an era past, is past recalling, take away weakness and take women too. But now I go to be thy advocate, sweet Cleopatra, and now I'll use my art, thy presence, will me greatly animate. Thy face will teach my tongue, thy love my heart. Am I ordained the careful messenger, the sad news-bringer of the strangest death, which self-hand did upon itself infer to free a captive soul from servile breath? Must I the lamentable wonder show which all the world must grieve and marvel at? The rarest form of death in earth below that ever pity glory wondered at. What news brings to you? Can Egypt yet yield more of sorrow than it hath? What can it add to the already overflowing store of sad affliction, matter yet more sad? Have we not yet seen the worst of our calamity? Is there behind yet something of distress, unseen, unknown? 
tell me if that greater misery there be, what that we will not, that which is less. Tell us what so it be and tell it first. For sorrow ever longs to hear her worst. Well, then the strangest thing relate I will that ever I of mortal man have seen. I, as you know, even from my youth, have still attended on the person of the Queen. And ever in all fortunes, good or ill, with her as one of chiefest trust have been. And now in these so great extremities that ever could to Majesty befall, I did my best in what I could devise. I left her not, till now she left us all. What? Is she gone? Hath Caesar forced her so? Yea, she is gone, and hath deceived him too. What, fled to India, to go find her son? No, not to India, but to find her son. Why, why then there's hope she may her state recover. Her state, nay, rather honour, and her lover. Her lover? Him she cannot have again. Well, she, well, him she hath, with him she doth remain. Why then she's dead? Is it so? Why speaks not thou? You guess aright, and I will tell you how. When she perceived all hope was clean bereft her, that Caesar meant to send her straight away, and saw no means of reconcilement left her work, what she could, she could not work to stay. She calls me to her, and she thus began. O thou whose trust hath ever been the same, and one in all my fortunes faithful man, alone content to attend disgrace and shame, thou, whom the fearful ruin of my fall never deterred to leave calamity, as did those other smooth state-pleasers all, who followed but my fortune and not me, tis thou must do a service for thy queen, wherein thy faith and skill must do their best. Thy honest care and duty shall be seen, performing this more than in all the rest. For all what thou hast done may die with thee, although tis pity that such faith should die. But this shall ever more remembered be a rare example to posterity. And look how long as Cleopatra shall in after ages live in memory, so long shall thy clear fame endure with all, and therefore thou must not my suit deny, nor contradict my will. For what I will, I am resolved, and this tis thou must do me. Go find me out with all thy art and skill, two aspects, and convey them close unto me. I have a work to do with them in hand, inquire not what, for thou shalt soon see what, if the heavens do not my designs withstand, do but thy charge, and let me shift with that. Being thus conjured by her whom I had vowed my true perpetual service, forth I went, devising how my close attempt to shroud, so that there might no art my art prevent. And so disguised in habit, as you see, having found out the thing for which I went, I soon returned again, and brought with me the aspics in a basket closely pent, which I had filled with figs and leaves upon, and coming to the guard that kept the door. What hast thou there? said they, and looked thereon, seeing the figs they deemed of nothing more, but said, they were the fairest they had seen. Taste some, said I, for they are good and pleasant. No, no, said they. Go bear them to thy queen. Thinking me some poor man that had brought a present, well, in I went, where, brighter than the sun, glittering in all her pompous rich array, great Cleopatra sat as if she had won Caesar and all the world beside this day, even as she was when on thy crystal stream, soul Sindos, did she show what earth could show. When Asia all amazed in wonder deems Venus from heaven as was come on earth below. Even as she went at first to meet her love, so go she now at last again to find him. But that first did her greatness only prove, this her, this last her love, that could not live behind him. Yet as she sat, the doubt of my good speed detracts much from the sweetness of her look. Cheer Mara care did then such passions breed that made her eye bewray the care she took. 
but she no sooner sees me in the place but straight her sorrow clouded brow she clears lightning a smile from out of stormy face which all her tempest beaten senses cheers look how a strayed perplexed traveller when chased by thieves and even at the point of taking descrying suddenly some town not far or some unlooked for aid to him would making cheers up his tired sprites thrusts forth his strength to meet that good that comes in so good hour such was her joy perceiving now at length her honour was to escape so proud a power forth from her seat she hastes to meet the present and as one overjoyed she caught it straight and with a smiling cheer and accent pleasant looking among the figs finds the deceit and seeing there the ugly venomous beast nothing dismayed she stays and views it well at length the extremist of her passion ceased when she began with words her joy to tell oh rarest beast saith she that afric breeds how dearly welcome art thou unto me the fairest creature that fair nylas feeds methinks i see in now beholding thee but though the never erring world doth deem the angered nature frame thee but in spite little they know what they so light esteem that never learn the wonder of thy might better than death death's office thou dischargest that with one gentle touch canst free our breath and in a pleasing sleep our soul enlargest making ourselves not privy to our death if nature erred oh then how happy error thinkest to make thee worse she made thee best sith thou best freest us from our lives worst terror in sweetly bringing souls to quiet rest when that inexorable monster death that follows fortune flies the poor distressed tortures our bodies ere he takes our breath and loads with pains or the already weak oppressed how oft have I begged, prayed, entreated him to take my life, and yet could never get him. And when he comes, he comes so ugly, grim, that who is he, if he could choose, would let him? Therefore come thou of wonders, wonder chief, that open canst with such an easy key the door of life. Come, gentle, cunning thief, that from ourselves so steals ourselves away. Well did our priests discern something divine shadowed in thee, and therefore first they did offerings and worships due to thee assign, in whom they found such mysteries were hid, comparing thy sweet motion to the sun that moves without the instruments that move, and never waxing old, but always one, dost sure thy strange divinity approve, and therefore too, the rather unto thee, in zeal I make the offering of my blood calamity confirming now in me a sure belief that piety makes good which happy men neglect or hold ambiguous and only the afflicted are religious and here i sacrifice these arms to death that lust late dedicated to delights offering up my last this last of breath the compliment of my love's dearest right with that she bears her arm and offer makes to touch her death yet at the touch withdraws and seeming more to speak occasion takes willing to die and willing to to pause look how a mother at her son's departing for some far voyage bent to get him fame doth entertain him with an idle parling and still doth speak and still speaks but the same now bids farewell and now recalls him back tells what was told and bids again farewell and yet again recalls for still doth lack something that love would fain and cannot tell pleased he should go yet cannot let him go so she although she knew there was no way but this yet she could not handle so but she must show that life desired delay. Fain would she entertain the time as now, and now would fain that death would seize upon her, whilst I might see. 
presented in her brow the doubtful combat tried twixt life and honour life bringing legions of fresh hope with her armed with the proof of time which yields we say comfort and help to such as do refer are all unto him and can admit delay but honour scorning life lo forth leads he bright immortality in shining armour thorough the way rays of whose clear glory she might see life's baseness how much it might harm her besides she saw whole armies of reproaches and base disgraces furies fire fearful sad marching with life and shame that still encroaches upon her face in bloody colours clad which representsments seeing worse than death she deemed to yield to life and therefore chose to render all to honour heart and breath and that with speed lest that her inward foes false flesh and blood joining with life and hope should mutiny against her resolution and to the end she would not give them scope she presently proceeds to the execution and sharply blaming of her rebel powers false flesh saith she and what dost thou conspire with caesar too as thou wert none of ours to work my shame and hinder my desire Wilt thou retain, in closure of my, thy veins, that enemy base life to my, to let my good? No, no, there is a greater power constrains than can be counter-checked with fearful blood, for to the mind that's great nothing seems great, and seeing death to be the last of woes, and life lasting disgrace which I shall get, what do I lose? that have but life to lose this having said strengthened in her own heart the union of her self senses in one charging together she performs that part that hath so great a part of glory one and so receives the deadly poisoning touch that touch that tried the gold of her love pure and hath confirmed her honour to be such as must a wonder to all worlds endure not now not an yielding shrink or touch of fear consenting to be ray less least sense of pain but still in one same sweet unaltered cheer her honour did her dying words retain well now this work is done saith she here ends this act of life that part of fates assigned me what glory or disgrace here this world lends both have i had and both i leave behind me and now o earth the theatre where i have acted this witness i die unforced witness my soul parts free to antony and now proud tyrant caesar do thy worst this said, she stays, and makes a sudden pause as twere to feel whither the poison wrought, or rather else the working might be caused that made her stay as likewise may be thought, for in that instant I might well perceive the drowsy humour in her falling brow, and how each power, each part oppressed did leave their former office, and in senseless grow, how like a new plucked branch against the sun declines his fading leaves in feeble sort so her disjoined jointures as undone let fall her weak dissolved limbs support yet lo that face the wonder of her life retains in death a grace that graceth death colour so lively cheer so lovely rife that none would think such beauty could want breath and in that cheer the impression of a smile did seem to show she scorned death and caesar as glorying that she could them both beguile and telling death how much her death did please her wonder it was to see how soon she went she went with such a will and so did haste it that sure i think she did her pain prevent foregoing pain or staying not to taste it and senseless in her sinking down she rise the diadem which on her head she wore which charmian poor weak feeble maid espies and haste to write it as it was before for eris now was dead and charmian too even at the point for both would imitate their mistress glory striving like to do 
But Charmian would in this succeed her mate, for she would have this honour to be last that would adorn that head that must be seen to wear a crown in death, that life held fast, that all the world might know she died a queen. And as she stood, setting it fitly on, lo, in rushed Caesar's messengers in haste, thinking to have prevented what was done, but yet they came too late all was past. For there they found stretched on a bed of gold dead Cleopatra, and of that proudly dead, in all the rich attire procure she could, and dying Charmian trimming of her head, and Eris at her feet dead in like case. Charmian, is this well done? said one of them. Yea, well, said she. And her that from the race of so great kings descends doth best become. And with that word yields to her faithful breath to pass the assurance of her love with death. But how knew Caesar of her close intent? By letters which before to him she sent. For when she had procured this means to die, she writes and earnestly entreats she might be buried in one tomb with Antony. Whereby then Caesar guessed all went not right, and forthwith sends, yet ere the message came she was dispatched. He crossed in his intent. Her providence had ordered so the same, that she was sure none should her plot prevent. Then thus we have beheld the accomplishment of woes, the full of ruin and the worst, worst of ills and seen all hope expelled, that ever sweet repose shall repossess the land that desolation fills, and where ambition spills with uncontrolled hand, all the issue of all those that so long rule have held, to make us no more us, but clean confound us thus. And canst O Nilus thou, father of floods endure, that yellow Tiber should with sandy streams rule thee, Wilt thou be pleased to bow to him those feet so pure, whose unknown head we hold a power divine to be? Thou that didst e'er see thy free banks uncontrolled, live under thine own care, I wilt thou bear it now? And now wilt yield thy streams and, and pray to other realms? Draw back thy waters, flow to thy concealed head, Rocks strangle up thy waves, stop cataracts thy fall, and turn thy courses so that sandy deserts dead, the world of dust that craves to swallow thee up all. May drink so much as shall revive from vasty graves, the living green, which spread far flourishing, may grow on that white, wide face of death, where nothing now draws breath. Fatten some people there. Even as thou us hast done with plenty's wanton store and feeble luxury, and them as us prepare, fit for the day of moan, respected not before. Leave levelled Egypt dry, the barren prey to lie, wasted for evermore of plenty's yield and none, to recompense the care of victors' greedy lust and bring forth naught but dust. And so, O oh, leave to thee, Sith thou art what thou art. Let not our race possess the inheritance of shame, the sea of sin that we have left into their heart, the yoke of whose distress must still upbraid our blame, telling from whom it came. Our weight of wantonness lies heavy on their heart, who never more shall see the glory of that worth they left who brought us forth. O thou all-seeing light, high president of heaven, your magistrates, the stars, of that eternal court of providence and right, are these the bounds you've given? The untranspassable bars that limit pride so short is greatness of this sort, that greatness, greatness mars, and wraps itself, self-driven on rocks of her own might. Doth order, order so disorders overthrow? And thus ends the text. Um, yes, I've forgotten how long some of those speeches were. <laughs>
I wasn't supposed to be doing two of those parts. Uh, that uh, there was a, a change of things last minute, and I just oh, it's fine. I'll just do, 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 throw the messenger in. That'll be okay. Um, yeah, that way. That the yeah. air. I, I I literally was struggling to actually see words towards the end. It was just like it was just so many words. Water, water everywhere. Um, but I mean that's the nature of an, uh, of a, uh, a neoclassical drama. Um, it's 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 lots of speeches. It's lots of this kind of, uh, of this kind of poetic uh, display. It's functioning more like a, a, a display of, of, of that. Um, I think when we talked about this last time, when we did the first look at it, I was very enthused about it as storytelling. And when it is doing active storytelling, I really do enjoy it. And there's part of me thinking that this is actually. We were talking about it. I think last time we were talking about the the, the, the there's there's this opportunity to sort of um, play around with uh, everybody's Cleopatra at some point. Pretty much everybody performs Cleopatra at some point, and that was that was an angle to take with it. Um, but as part of me thinking, you could almost pull this back into into something even smaller scale of of the number of voices you've got here, because so much of this is related action that it becomes a, a, a an act of storytelling. It's 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 like there there are certain bits where actually when you actually have scenes it's like it almost gets in the way in in, in rather than the other way around. I I, I um people may disagree because there's quite a lot of it. I'm I, I am as ever not wholly a fan of the the chorus in these plays. Um, uh, I don't know how you felt about the chorus, Desna. Um, but it's then then they're not. They they I mean choruses by their nature sort of dance around themes rather than you know move narrative forward or do other things but i'm not really sure what that chorus was doing most of the play <laughs> i'm really unclear what what half of those 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 ones were doing i don't know did anyone else find the chorus enervating <laughs> Lindsay. Yeah, i did yeah um i mean i i enjoyed it and i um and i it was read beautifully um by desna but mm. i feel like the function of it's almost like the characters themselves serve the function of the chorus because mm. they're all very self-aware yeah and they all comment on their own actions and what they're doing so the, the kind of idea of the chorus is a bit it's kind of superseded by the other voices i think or mm. yeah. yeah um and it, it, it's 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 do it, the, the chorus is doing a certain job that is is sort of coming at one remove as well because it's the sort of thing that is is coming from uh the the french influence to the translation that led to this this new play so it's 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 like the chorus is the opportunity to play around with verse and meter in a slightly experimental way at times uh and that makes it quite difficult <laughs> to to work with uh olga were you oh uh, no i just noticed that in one scene chorus just took a part of some nameless character basically mm. uh and yeah acted in a totally different way just like a another character just an author decided not to give him a name, just to give it to Chorus, which is a bit strange too. Yeah, because that was that was a case where you're going, Dollar Bella could do that, or you know, someone who's literally was already on could do that, and and rather than than give that to the chorus, and and that the chorus is is either massively truncatable or 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 do away with the ball. Um, I, I I feel because I mean it's it's a chunky play. It's not an excessively long play, but. Because of the amount of words coming at you as as flow of of speech, it, it feels you know it's it's a heavy thing to take in, and and to do it as a as, as a live show, I, I feel you need to you need to throw the audience a bit of a crumb. Uh, even though I really like this kind of thing, and a lot of people you know there will be an audience for this density of poetry. Um, you know it it's it's you know we couldn't advertise this as a as a sort of exciting en en energetic play in the way that. Uh, 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 other plays are. Um, you have to buy into the neoclassical universe, um, or, or, or you, you you can't do it. Um, uh, other thoughts? I have I have lots of thoughts. Um, uh, Desna. Yeah, just quickly on the chorus. I, I I kind of felt it. You could completely dispense with quite a lot of it. <laughs> um, mm. I, I felt the bits where the chorus was most successful was where it really felt like the the voice of Egypt. So that's I suppose what it's doing in this is as in i suppose the voice of the commoners mm. in inverted commas as a put rather than the kings and queens and all their nefarious goings on and then mm. there were a couple of points where i felt it it was successful with that but the rest of it mm. 
because it's like it's not like often the chorus really functions as a stopgap between people entering who who came off in the previous scene. You could have C uh, Cleopatra's opening oration. You could go straight to Caesar. Um, I trimmed back the two philosophers um, heavily. I, I found their opening gambit utterly impenetrable. And then you sort of figure out, oh, they're talking about whether it's right to kill children or not. And you go, oh, that's quite interesting. Um, but it doesn't come across for such a long time what they're actually discussing. Um, and they act as a bit of a stopgap for the entrance of Caesar and Cleopatra um, trimmed back. Um, and of course, what we could do of course is if in a stage production is is have the characters who are being related step into the action I, you know because cleopatra could have more to say um how does cleopatra feel about that i so love the reported speech of all of that i think it's actually much more effective having it as reported speech and particularly with rodon because it's just this all the dramatic irony going on with rodon telling the story of what she did and his own treachery and betrayal i just felt that and similar with uh with the messenger you know I, I i just feel it's so much better hearing the effect it has on the person who is telling the story rather than seeing the character do it i mean she you know gives herself a great send-off and off she goes you know <laughs> hmm. never to be seen again i feel <laughs> so well, I, 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 to a degree, I agree with the, the with Rodons. I really enjoyed Rodons on, yeah. on the whole. I, I, I felt that was that was really quite nicely done because he's got betrayal as part of a motivation, you know, thing to be telling. Mm -hmm. Whereas with the messenger, it felt like it'd be quite good if she appears and talks to him at that moment. And I, 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 I that's sort of the one, the, 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 the option I want to play with uh, at another run um, at this one uh, for mm -hmm. further on. But because uh, it didn't feel, especially when he then goes on and talks about, you know, of oh, tries to, tries to make the poison work or doesn't quite, uh, and it's sort of that back and forth where I thought, well, that was a bit over egged, <laughs> shall we say that particular pudding? I was sort of going, <laughs> oh, uh, are we there yet? Is she dead yet? <laughs> 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 um, but that may also just because by that point I was very tired. Um, yes. You you heroically did a very great deal of prose or verse rather. So yeah, uh, yeah. I shouldn't I shouldn't have done. I should have stuck with just Rodon and moved something else around um, or given it to you because yeah. um, <laughs> you're dead by that point. I could have done that. Didn't think of that. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, as 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 ever. I mean, Samuel Daniel duh, duh, really can can write when uh, uh and and give something quite beautiful um i say it's 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 neoclassical it's it's more about the poetry it's more about uh the dignity there's an awful lot of the same kind of themes and the same stuff happening the same uh, stuff going on um so there's a lot of repetition there um but i definitely think a a, a sensible trim you've you've got you know a, a a good hour 70 minute show rather than our reading lasted about an hour 40 i think you could happily tr truncate it down to a single half show um whether you do that with the tragedy of antony or cut down as the first half of the show or whether that's a bit too much bread on bread i don't know um but i think there's a tight show in this um uh, specifically focused on on the poetry of it um which i don't normally do i normally say make it more actiony but i like the storytelling of it i really do um any other thoughts um, I thought Cleopatra's opening speech was was excellent. I really, really loved that. the 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 f narrative, the thought shifts in Cleopatra's first speech. I thought that was that was particularly tight. Um, how did you feel about your later Cleopatra, your 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 your, your death scenario or pre-death? Um, pre-death scenario. Yes. Um, yes. Yes, I mean, I like doing all of it. Um, and I think it's very, um, I mean, the verse is quite regular. Um, it's quite, the thought structures are quite um, straightforward, I think. Uh, I think there was only one chunk of text, and don't ask me where it was. It was about eight lines where I looked at it and looked at it and looked at it. And I, I thought, I kind of get what I think she's saying, but it's not entirely clear to me. And I thought, if I just do it with confidence it may convey something that I'm not seeing in it but that was in like a few lines in the middle of you know a great big long a great big long bit um 
Yeah, I I like it. I like the um I like that sort of disputation about whether Anthony's ghost can hear her or not and is there any point to, you know, doing all of this and you know the kind of internal argument she has with herself and all of that. It's all it's all really good stuff, I think. Mm. Yes, and, and in her reported speech, I do uh, the, the 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 farewell for her son and and that, mm. that we've got there that you know that the that um you know again it's the, there's a, there's lots of nice little bits of potential there mm -hmm. okay any more for any more otherwise i will close this session as oh, we are well over time um uh so uh well nobody else is waving uh additional thoughts all that remains thank all the wonderful readers for all their wonderful readings thank you very much everyone and goodbye